It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sakiko Fukuda Parr. And Sakiko is at the New School here in New York City with the Graduate Program for International Affairs. And uh, she's going to be sharing with us uh, her perspectives and insights on the MDGs, the SDGs, and the post-2015 development agenda in the hope that we might be able to explore how to advance the social dimension in pace with both the economic and the environmental dimensions. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to present to you uh, Sakiko. Thank you, Sakiko. Uh, thank you very much for, um, for uh, this uh, opportunity to speak to you. Um, I uh, have um, been um, doing um, quite a bit of writing and thinking about the Millennium Development Goals in the last uh, several years, actually, because several years ago, somebody asked me to write a book about the MDGs as part of the International Institution series. And I found it very difficult to finish this book because it's sort of this moving target. And I was about to finish it about a year ago when all of this post-2015 thing started and it sort of became really impossible. Uh, but in the course of it, I've written a number of papers, um, all of which are available and I can, uh, if actually my personal net uh, website has them all. But today, um, I want to talk more about the whole issue of target setting and uh, the criteria by which you should set targets and select indicators. Um, and I'm going to be sharing with you the results of a research project that I have been coordinating together with a colleague of mine at Harvard, Alicia Yeaman. And um, basically, uh, I mean, you know, these Millennium Development Goals have taken over the development debate. It just seems to dominate everything that uh, we talk about. And um, the millennium, you know, global goals are something that have been with us for decades. The first goals were set in the 1960s, I think with the first development decade. And there was a growth target of something quite high. I can't remember what that was. But there have been many development goals. And they were, they were set in different settings. And um, like, you know, there was a um, health for all target. There was a immunization target. There was children's target. Um, and it was really the Millennium Development Goals that became very famous. And um, so one of the issues with the Millennium Development Goals is that somehow we have got into a situation where these targets are now no longer subservient to an objective like gender equality and women's rights, but somehow that the goals, the targets and the goals themselves seem to be driving the agenda. And that's, there's this enormous power uh, that has been accorded to these uh, targets. And, um, you know, it's a bit like this management by results business where uh, public services are held to account for delivering on I mean, this is particularly true, I think, in Britain, uh, you know, reducing costs of, you know, having your appendicitis <laughs> treated or something. Uh, so these, there are these management targets, management consultants, you know, advise managers to set targets, and this is a way to improve efficiency. And it's a bit like that, that, that somehow we have to make development work more efficient by setting the targets and seeing if they, we achieve them. So. But there is something peculiar about these, this thing called target setting because they not only have uh, positive consequences, but they have very wide range of unintended consequences. So, um, one, so, so Alicia Yemen and I started this research project where um, we looked systematically at 11 MDG targets and what actually happened to them, what sort of effects they had. And we draw on the literature of um, sociology and anthropology, uh, sociolo in the field of sociology of knowledge, that has actually studied what numbers do. 
And um, so, um, I mean, I think that th there is this widespread view that um, the Millennium Development Goals have been extremely successful, that they have been successful in mobilizing support for development and for putting, drawing attention to global poverty reduction. And I don't want to argue against that success, although quite frankly, if you sort of look into it and you think, is it really because of the MDGs? Well, anyway, the MDGs probably helped. And for sort of, uh, you know, um, providing a framework around which development uh, stakeholders can can have a conversation about what's important, what's not important. And I think it's wonderful that the MDGs have highlighted the importance of poverty, highlighted the importance of people, highlighted the importance of development around the world. But I think we, what is troubling is why this, these targets have somehow taken over our thinking about what priorities are and the simplification that they brought into development debates. So let me just start by saying that we started looking at, so sort of this is kind of theoretical, if you like, uh, at the literature on global goals. And um, sociologists and anthropologists have been looking at them as basically policy tools, and um, that they are set with the objective of mobilizing political support for neglected priorities. Um, uh, but that they have these, uh, and, and as I mentioned, you know, the MDGs probably did that, but they have these unintended con consequences. And this literature on the uh, sociology of, of numbers, the sociology of no knowledge, um, points out that, um, that, that numbers, just because you quantify something, you can say reduce poverty or you can say reduce the proportion of people who live on less than a dollar a day. And somehow, by my saying, reduce the proportion of people who live on less than a dollar a day, it gives this aura of scientific exactitude, as if I know exactly what I'm talking about. And I've measured the pervasiveness of something, of poverty, and I've defined poverty, and I've figured out how to measure it, and I've figured out how to monitor it. And it all sounds very authoritative, legitimate, and scientific. And it sounds like I know how to make it happen. You don't know whether this is true or not, but at least <laughs> this, is just this, this language of numbers gives this aura of scientific certitude and concreteness. And the use of numbers has two kinds of effects. The first kind of effect is you, what you can call governance effects. Well, you can also call it policy effects. That they, and the second effect is knowledge effects. You can call that um, like ide effect on ideas. So the first effect, the governance effect, or the, the, they are effectively empirical effects on changing policies. Did they actually do that? Well, we, we look at each one of the, these 11 goals because these numbers, these targets are set by the UN General Assembly or whoever, but there is no uh, implementation plan I mean, they, they, there is a sort of a pretense that there is an implementation plan, but it is not as if there is, it is the director of a hospital who commands resources and personnel and has the power and authority to give directives that declares that there will be some target to be met, like the cost of an appendectomy is going to be reduced from, I don't know, $10,000 to $8,000 or something. Uh, those who set these global development targets have no control over implementation mechanisms. What global goals therefore do is that they create incentives. And what do they create? In, how do they create incentives? They create incentives by setting standards so that, you know, different governments or different would want to try to achieve those standards and so they uh, try to comply and then they come to the UN and then they say what a wonderful thing that it is that they've done. There's something tremendously bad about this. The reason why is because one of the problems we discovered with the MDGs 
is that you set one target that is supposed to be applied to every single country. And you, the MDG set a target, reduce the proportion of people living on less than a dollar a day by half by 2015. Well, it's the same 50% for Tanzania that probably has a poverty rate of, I don't know, 80% or something. And a middle income country in Latin America that maybe has a poverty rate of like 10% or maybe 5% by the dollar a day standard. For most middle income countries, dollar a day standard is kind of meaningless. Their national poverty rates are nonetheless very high. You look at Colombia, they have a very high poverty rate by their national lines. But because they have this single global universal line, you know, you're, compa you're saying Colombia, you did a wonderful job, and you're saying Tanzania, Ethiopia, Burkina Faso, you did a lousy job because you're off track. Well, of course they're off track. First of all, because they started at this very, very high <laughs> level. Moreover, they started the starting point at 1990. Well, it so happens that they set this target in 2000, but the starting point was put back to 1990. The decade of the 1990s, from 1990 to 2000, was a period of extremely slow economic growth around the world, for, uh, well, particularly for, for sub-Saharan African countries. Okay? It was a good period of, of growth for, for some of the European, US, and so forth, the roaring 90s for uh, stockbrokers in, uh, the, for Wall Street in the US, but it was a terrible period for Africa, in part because commodity prices did not, were, were, were low. So, you know, it's, it's like setting a target that was extremely unfair to the poorest countries. And this idea of setting a single standard of performance for every single country in the world is actually extremely unfair for those with the biggest problems. Um, so there are all of these complexities that make this business of global car target setting very complicated. So one of the lessons that we learned from the MDGs is they absolutely have to be global targets. You cannot apply that same target to every single country and compare them, compare performance. So one of them, I think one of the lessons of this is that we need to absolutely make sure that there is um, as much focus on national adaptation F for that, that, that I hope that, you know, if we have global targets again after 2015, we know how it is that countries should put into a process for adapting that global target to their national realities so that the global target is set for global achievement, not for every country, and that every country needs to mobilize itself at the local level to discuss okay, we have this target of income poverty, what does this mean in Colombia? Does it mean that we've achieved it already because by a dollar a day, you know, it's very minimal? Or do we look at the national poverty rate and say we still have a big problem? Same thing in the, think about the United States. Does the poverty target apply to the United States, there is plenty of poverty in this country, but not with a standard of a dollar a day. Um, so there, there is this sort of a, if, if a question of what kind of policy effects did the MDGs have, and we investigated that for many of the countries, many of the, the goals. And then they also have knowledge effects, and I think this is perhaps one of the most important things, that um, Numbers have a way of being so easy to communicate that they begin to um, define things. So, you know, indicators are supposed to be proxies, what we call in statistics proxies. It's supposed to be a measure of something, an indicator of something, not the goal itself. So, uh, but, but you begin to think that the target itself that the goal, that the proxy indicator itself is the goal. So think about gender equality. There is a goal for empowerment of women and gender equality. There was only one target. That was primary and secondary education. So do we think that primary, 
gender equality and, and the rights of women and the empowerment of women is only about education? Of course not. There was a 13-point uh, Beijing agenda. But the, but the platform of action that was adopted at Beijing, that was broad and that was built up from the you know, discussions everywhere and with national governments negotiating. And by national governments, we don't mean, <laughs> with all my excuses, the diplomats who sit in the, in the GA here, but I mean the Ministry of F Social Affairs, the Ministry of Education. The, so, you know, if you think about who is involved in defining the agenda, it was at that level. And, and, and that broad 13-point agenda got shunted down to this tiny little target. And that target sort of can begin to define what we think, you know, gender equality and empowerment of women is all about. And it's just very troubling, you know, this translation of big ideas into these narrow things that are defined by um, by uh, these numbers. And of course, I am terribly aware of this because, uh, as some of you might know, I used to run the human development reports of UNDP for, for you know, from 95 to 2004. And so many people said, oh, you know, you do the HDI, the Human Development in Index, became so much more famous than human development. And we always used to say that the concept of human development is much broader than the index itself. Because in the index doesn't have things like human rights or equality or gender equality. We, no, it's basically because it's a kind of a, you know, a proxy for trying to monitor how well we are doing. It's really not a full-fledged um, measure. So there is this problem, and the sociologists point out that there is something inherent in numbers and, and that is that they simplify complex concepts. Uh, they also reify intangible concepts. You see, I mean, something like gender equality is really like an intangible idea, and it's difficult to, to measure, but, you know, and to render concrete. That's sort of like the whole point of it. And, but the, the third thing it does is it abstracts. Now, we all know that something like gender equality is very location-specific. What gender equality means in the year 2013 in New York is different from what it meant in the year 1990 in New York or in uh, New Jersey, the rural areas of New Jersey, even across the river, let alone what it means in Burkina Faso today or in India, in urban India, in rural India, and so forth. So we know that development work is quintessentially something that is location specific, that we cannot generalize a one size fits all idea. And that, um, you know, what it means for the lives of people kind of plays out and manifests itself in different ways. But using these targets and numbers is, is this way of abstracting these, the diversity into something simple and abstract. And that's the reason why people like it, because it is concrete, because it's universal, because it's simple. But that simplicity, abstraction, and reification is precisely what is very misleading, because we know development is something that is complicated, and you can't just have a silver bullet solution. Um, so we have this uh, project where we had 11 case studies of uh, each focused on a target, and we examine normative origins, empirical effects on policy priorities, normative effects on discourses and narratives, that is, these are, these are changes and shifts in ideas, choice of, uh, and then we looked specifically at the choice of indicators used and what incentive effects that they created and uh, what alternative indicators could have been used. So now that we're in this period in debates about the MDG post-2015 um, agenda and the sustainable development goals, which is going to be focused much more on the specific indicators, the lessons of what we found about the choice of indicators, I think, could be quite useful. 
because the what indicator you 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 choose does actually matter, as we found out. So, okay, what we found out is that in terms of the intended consequences of the, of these MDGs, they were very effective. They, you know, they they uh, they mobilized support. That's what they were supposed to do. And some of them were particularly successful, like HIV AIDS goal. But others were poor cousins. And I think this is one of the things that we have to remember, that some of them were successful, but there were like eight goals and, I don't know, 20-odd targets and 60 indicators. And some, of, some or like the dollar a day, the dollar 25 a day, were very successful. The HIV one was successful. But no one paid any attention to HIV orphans. <laughs> Nobody paid any attention to, uh, like, the hunger goal, the employment goal, and uh, the, um, the partnership goal. And then in between, uh, many of the authors found kind of troubling effects of uh, many of the other goals, like water, sanitation, child, um, maternal mortality, child survival, and education. So, but there were plenty of unintended consequences. So in terms of their empirical effects on policy, uh, or uh, you know, what you might call governance effects, you know, basically what's in is good, but that was plenty that was left out. So what happened to all these priorities that were left out? So in the area of sexual and reproductive health, it was good to have had maternal mortality. But what about family planning? You know, it kind of got shunted aside. So there was this kind of a reorientation of development agendas and priorities, which was not necessarily intended, but it was, it happened. So much focus went into recalculating maternal mortality rates because, and it was an extremely poor choice of indicator because maternal mortality rates are extremely poorly collected data and so much of it is basically synthetic. That is, they're just created upon a model. Um, so the, um, uh, the, the other thing that, that happened is that there was, well, there was this sort of silo effect. People became so obsessed about that one particular target that, you know, this, there wasn't this idea that you were improving the lives of, let's say, indigenous people or a group of people. It was sort of like this vertical campaign for malaria, <laughs> vertical campaign for uh, primary education. And by the way, the education people are extremely upset about the education goal because there was nothing on literacy, there was nothing on adult education, there's nothing on tertiary education, there was nothing on quality, ed so much emphasis on the quantity of enrollment, all right? So now there were even sort of like these perverse effects and, uh, and, and, and I think you know, a good, you know, sort of like a silly example is that you say, well, 100 million slum dwellers, well, let's just bulldoze away slums and you've met them. But the, the, the problem is that, you know, bad targets can really mislead, right? And it can really, uh, they can really mislead. And the, one of the studies on uh, the slums, the urban uh, development one is, extremely critical of this target because first of all, the target was set on very little basis. 100 million slum dwellers, well, first of all, that's only 5% of the population of urban slums. And we know that urbanization is a very important part of the process of development that's taking place today. The, problem, the thing about urban areas, the process of urbanization, it is a motor of development and empowerment and people. So it's, there is absolutely nothing there about generating kind of development, you know, urbanization as a motor of development. It's all about this, you know, the, the paper says, you enter the city through the bathroom and the, <laughs> and the house because it's all about the number of uh, you know, sanitation facilities and the, the, the square footage of your housing. 
Um, so it actually kind of distorted that urban development agenda away from what about you know, securing jobs, what about improving quality, what about improving, it, it just looked at this with very narrow agenda, at th rather silly num numbers. And then um, there were these eff effects on ideas, the knowledge effects. And I think in many respects that, um, you know, as, a, as somebody who studied a lot about the history of ideas about development. The 1990s was a very, it was a wonderful period because during the, that 1990s, there were all kinds of ideas that came out about the fact that, about human development and, and human development as expansion of freedoms and capabilities, Amartya Sen and his work that said that, you know, development is about people being able to do what they are want to do and having choices and that uh, this requires, of course, education and health and all of these things, but that all of these things are interrelated. Somehow all of that went, and, and the, the underlying idea behind all of that was that development is a process of change, a dynamic process of social change and economic change. So there is nothing in the MDGs that was about this process of economic transformation of poor countries. There's nothing there about the transformation of society so that they would be less unequal. And so that the poor and the marginalized would have more say and voice and that the authorities would be more accountable. And powerful actors like global corporations would actually be held to account for some of the things that may have adverse consequences on people's lives. So um, it became this very narrow, reduced form of a basic needs agenda. I mean, there's nothing wrong with what is in the MDGs, there's nothing wrong with the, M the basic needs, but we've learned that there's so much more that you have to attend to. So um, the other thing that we found is that they, it sort of affected the political dynamics of mobilization, that it kind of you know, undercut all that was going on in the 1990s on the basis of the 1990s conferences. For example, the Beijing Agenda, you know, the women's groups are mobilized uh, around that. Uh, and all of a sudden you have the MDGs. People uh, working on education in the Philippines say, well, we were arguing with the government about the need for more secondary education, quality education, and then come the MDGs and it says all you need is universal primary education. It kind of undercut their advocacy. Is they, 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 there was also this peculiar thing that happened that, you know, the, um, like the hunger goal was rewritten. The, the, the World Food Summit in 1996 set a goal of halving the number of hungry people. They changed it to proportion of hungry people. Of course, that's a less ambitious target. Um, and it sort of shifted these dynamics. So, um, I, 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 what I want to say is that, you know, we have to be, we live in the world of these indicators and uh, we have to not throw them away and that's not what I'm saying. Uh, we have to do a better job of setting targets and we also have to understand their limitations. I am going to go on for one more minute. We won't go through all of these. Um, so, you know, we have um, in the current uh, debates about post-2015, uh, a lot of studies being done about how you should set targets. And they all, like the Rio uh, outcome agenda uh, said it had to be you know, limited in number, concrete, actionable, uh, universally applicable, but nationally relevant or something like that. 
and taking account of the national specificities. Um, and, and these are the ones that come from the, um, to th the high level panel report. They say they should be easy to understand, measurable, widely applicable, ref be the voice of people, encapsulate a compelling message. Now, um, one of the problems with all of these uh, criteria is that, you know, these criteria of having a short list, the simplicity, the concreteness, the measurability, simple to understand, those are important criteria for setting targets when you want to use these goals for the purposes of mobilizing support. But the problem is that if you want to use them for monitoring progress and particularly for holding individual countries accountable or for allocating resources and for programming, they are extremely misleading because simplicity means that for programming purpose, anything that is not there is ignored. That is a perverse consequence that you want to avoid, right? Concrete and easy to understand means that some of the complexities of development about empowerment is not there. So for programming purposes, it's a lousy criterion, right? So, uh, I mean, I, I think that, and then there is this extreme focus. We just want these outcomes. Well, Yes, I believe that it's important to focus on human well-being outcomes in development. In fact, as you know, I've been arguing that for decades, that what matters is not the size of the economy, it's the, the life of human beings, you know, life expectancy, but under five mortality, that tells you so much more about the real well-being of people and communities than GDP growth. But you can take that too far because the real challenges are not just about these human well-being. Those things are important, but there is more to what we want to achieve. We want a more just world. And that means that certain institutions have to be there, that you have to deal with unfair trade rules, for example. And those issues are difficult to encapsulate in these uh, simple Employment is terribly important, but difficult to measure. Democracy is important, but difficult to measure. All of those difficult to measure things get shunted out of this framework. So um, um, we also have here uh, desirable characteristics of indicators. Yes, uh, for communication and mo mobilization, um, we want all these things like data availability and reliability, but we also want to foster creation of new data. Uh, we, we want to have um, global aggregates and inter-country comparability, but we also want for the purposes of programming and local monitoring, um, country and location specific uh, indicators. So um, we want them we want data to be dis subject to disaggregation so that you can tell what the difference in achievements are for men and women, for um, region A versus region B, for rural areas versus urban areas, and particularly the contrast between indigenous people and the, the general population, uh, the, and, and um, contrast amongst racial groups, ethnic groups, linguistic groups. Um, and we want qualitative information as well as quantitative information. So um, some of the things that are coming out in these current debates about criteria for goals, targets, indicators, I think need to be looked at with a great deal of um, scrutiny. And I would say that, you know, number one, we have to um, make sure that these data are available in setting global targets, but that there should be encouragement also to create new data on things that matter but that haven't been measured. One of the problems with using data on things that, have already, that are available 
for which data is available, is that these are old agendas. So you've got education data for, uh, because that's been around for a long time. New issues like you know, corruption uh, is a new issue. They didn't talk about it 20 years ago. So if you want to progress, <laughs> you have to, you can't rely on existing data, data availability. Uh, secondly, I would really emphasize the need for data that can be disaggregated. So, in fact, dollar a day is a terrible data because it's an estimation in most cases, cannot be disaggregated. National poverty rates are disaggregated. Um, and um, the, the third thing that I w want to emphasize is that we need to, to say that, you know, these global targets are global, but that local targets need, to, there has to be a process for, se for encouraging the setting of local targets and local accountability, that the global targets cannot be used for local targets and local accountability. And finally, we have to make these targets sort of subservient to our important political objects, social and political objectives, and not the other way around. Thank you. <laughs>